The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I hope now that you'll also begin to draw in a really explicit way, although I know you've been doing it all semester anyway, on your own memory of, pro of television programs, primetime fiction programs that have mattered to you folks. And we're going to, we're going to be looking uh, within certain very um, coercive limits at uh, programs from the 80s and 90s uh, 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 in, the, in the final few classes that we have beginning uh, on next next week on the on, on the uh, on the twentieth, uh, uh, and and there's one aspect of this uh, process on which I need to rely on you, and I'm hoping that many of you will come armed with very succinct and and and, and profound and clarifying comments about certain kinds of programs. One turn that television takes, you're all aware of it, I'm sure, uh, as the network consensus as the consensus system doesn't disappear but begins to break down and fray and and, and and fragment into so many subcultural appeals that we even begin to see, as you surely have realized by now, particular networks, cable networks especially, but even some broadcast networks like Fox that are, that are uh, aimed at particular subcultures and, uh, rather than at the whole of the population. And one can see what happens when that, begin, when that, when that process begins. We, we, one thing I'd like you to think about are some various pieces of evidence that reinforce and clar support that perspective, and I'm talking about things like the emergence of MTV and the emergence of shopping channels and the emergence of a science fiction channel, that sort of thing. But then, then sp specifically in terms of fiction programming, Charisse, we're sitting over at this end of the classroom today because of tricks we want to do with the camera. Uh, one of the most distinctive features of the fiction programming that I know many of you know much more deeply than I do is what I'll call this turn toward a youth audience. The, the way in which a, 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 a really relatively significant number of programs, and in many ways, some of the most distinctive and interesting programs that appear on television in the 80s and especially in the 90s, are specifically targeted at younger audiences, at, at, uh, at, at teenagers and at young college students. I'm thinking of, and of course, can you tell me the names of quickly of such programs, what, what such programs might be? Some of them, of course, are running on, on the medium right now. They go back a bit. Name some of them. 90210. 90210. One, one of the earliest. Another one. Dawson's Buffy. Creek. Dawson's Creek. Felicity. Felicity the Vampire. Felicity the Vampire. Seventh Heaven. Freaks and Geeks. Freaks and Geeks. Small Undeclared. Right? And in fact, it's actually a distinctive. It's a distinctive grouping or family of programs that may be one of the most uh, uh, significant developments in in uh, in terms of. In, in, in terms of the, the vast field of television fiction, of, tele of, of uh, television storytelling, that one might identify in the 80s and 90s. And we'll want to, yes? Uh, I find that that's consistent with the film industry also. I mean, the 80s, uh, with the production of all the like John Hughes films, and then the 90s when Clueless came out and sort of reinvigorated well, I, this like, I think there, I think there is, a, there is some influence from the film industry, but remember, I mean, I think I think you have to remember that the that the film industry has been aiming at a younger demographic for 30 years, and it's not at nearly so decisive a feature. We can go back into the late, certainly into the into the uh, 60s and early 70s, and begin to see really clearly that that a, a significant proportion of movies are already realizing that that uh, in order to uh, succeed, they need to appeal to that to that special de that teenage demographic. Uh, I think it becomes a, a, t a factor in television because of w w when we begin to have a proliferation of channels and perspectives and, how, and, and uh, there, uh, this variety of choice uh, becomes a, a decisive feature of the television landscape in the country. Uh, but I think there is an influence from some of the films and, the, and, the, and, and, and uh, in many ways, uh, in, in many respects, uh, uh, the the youth-oriented the youth-oriented films do do I think uh, 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 begin the process in a certain way, or that or, or another way to put it is that the, I think the television programs are par as you suggest are partly influenced by those, although there are other influences as well having to do just with what the Nielsen numbers, the ratings numbers, especially when they're broken down into demographic subgroups, tell the uh, 
programmers about what they're up to. Some of the cable stations and some of the new uh, new networks, like the Fox Network or the uh, the Lifetime Channel, uh, when they, when they when they actually when they actually uh, uh, began to go out before before they were before they began to broadcast programming, when they actually went out to try to get financing for what they were doing, they relied on demographic data, and they and and, and part of their rationale for for in for investors was there is this group of people in the country to whom we think we can appeal, with the, uh, uh, to whom the network, the the the, the, centra, the main networks, the, the the older networks that have that, that have, uh, existed before the advent of of uh, cable and and satellite broadcasting, do not appeal or to or, or are not successfully appealing, and uh, one can see that the networks then also responded. Because programs like what, what would be some examples of network programs that respond to this trend and try to reach those sa something of that same audience? Shows like Friends, I think, would be an example of that kind of thing, and there are there are other, others as well. The, the, net, the, the primary networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, are of course all, in some sense, are still uh, more ambitious to reach a wider kind of audience than the than the more specialized cable system. Uh, networks, but but that distinction is a very partial one these days. And one can look at ABC's programming, for example, and see uh, that it 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 has been deeply uh, uh, affected by competition from these other sources. This process, we might note parenthetically, is not a totally new one. And even in the era when there were not a lot of uh, when there was not a lot of competition, it was still possible to identify some networks as appealing to older and some networks as appealing. To younger viewers, ABC began to improve its ratings at a much earlier stage, before the advent of all these competitive systems, by appealing to a younger audience. And it was known, in some sense, as the audience of young people for a, for a while. Yes. Uh, yes. I was just wondering if there are any studies um, correlating youth on the web and sort of acknowledge, like the basic mass media <laughs> acknowledgement of this new demographic. I'm not. I'm not aware of that of of specific studies, but it. But what you're. But it is certainly true that that there there's a widespread recognition of this. And when you mention the web, I'm not sure this is what you have in mind. But but uh, one of the most distinctive features of many of these programs is their web presence. And there was these programs. Uh, now now all programs now have some kind of web identity, but the but 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 the ones that appeal to the younger audiences often created uh, a kind of a, a series of separate dramas. On the web, that kept the audience uh, engaged in uh, a certain part of their audience engaged in their programs through a kind of interactivity that had never been available to television before. Uh, Buffy is a terrifically clear example of that, and the creator of Buffy has talked about the way in which the web presence of the program feeds into and complicates his show. And as we've suggested, that is one also a distinctive and interesting feature of television in the in the uh, of contemporary television, the way in which it is. Uh, uh, Creating alliances with other emerging technologies in order to complicate and, and, and enhance its capacity to reach an audience. Charisse. Uh, last semester in Jenkins' converging media class, yes. one the man who runs the Dawson's Creek website came in and talked to us, and apparently the Dawson's Creek website is in, is completely independent of the show. Like they don't even relate, they hardly relate to the show. They don't even get the scripts until a week in advance. And uh, and also I want to say that the, that the existence of websites for television shows I think are keeping more and more shows on the air because not everyone has a Nielsen box. You know, not every teenager has a Nielsen box, but every teenager has a well, every teenager has access that's to possible. a That's possible. In other words, they're able to say, look, we're getting these many hits to our website, and that's proof that there's a real audience. Even out. without the Nielsen yes, rating. Yes, that's an interesting point, and an important one. It's another example of the way the old network hegemony is breaking down, because one of the most interesting, we haven't talked about it in the course, but one of, uh, one of the most interesting aspects, comical in a way, or ironic aspects of the history of television, is the way in which the major networks embraced this, this rating system which is really a very uh, a very inadequate measure of, of what the audience uh, is actually doing. But because uh, it was convenient for the networks to have a measure, they didn't really, I think they didn't really care whether the measure was accurate. All they wanted to be able to do was to, was to have a measurement they could use when they spoke to advertisers. And there was even a kind of advantage to them in not inquiring too deeply into the limitations of the Nielsen numbers. 
but there have been from almost the very beginning uh, systematic uh, uh, questions raised especially by social scientists who understand principles of scientific sampling about the way in which the Nielsen uh, system has worked. It has been refined over the years and improved but it is, and I'm not suggesting that it's, an, that, it, that its measurement of audiences is entirely inaccurate, but we know that there are venues in which television is widely used that Nielsen numbers don't take adequate account of. One of them are com is communal spaces. The number of people who watch television in bars or in, or in, uh, in, in dormitories, right? Uh, Nielsen, Nielsen numbers don't really take account of that. And that's also, I think, uh, why, uh, Many people have made an argument to the effect that the younger audience has been inadequately measured by the Nielsen numbers. And why Sharice's point about the websites is important. Erin, you have a hand up? other non-cable networks is really almost not a distinction at all anymore because like I for me like when I was growing up like I didn't know that you know that they were the first three or that they had the most money or whatever and so there was no difference to me between you know the WB and NBC like it was all sort of just the same they were just like public and they were available to you just the same yeah but exactly you, but weren't you able you were certainly able to feel differences of style or appeal on them well but you? I don't think that I don't think that it, like it, de it generally like it came off that one was more major or one was like no a right oh I, I see yeah I think the, you're right of course, of course and especially and I think that it made a big difference too that um, you know as far as like you know programs weren't necessarily better or worse and and especially sports moving off of the major networks now that the Fox has baseball and yeah, that's a very important point in, in fact the movement the Fox spent a fortune to get some of the major sports events as a way of demonstrating that it was an equal player in this network game. And I, you're absolutely right that one of, the, uh, one of the distinctive features of the last five or ten years has been the, the, the emergence of these secondary networks into, a, into virtually equal status with the, with the original big three. In terms, of, in terms of actual numbers of viewers, it remains the case that ABC, NBC, and CBS almost always outdraw by a, a, a tremendously large factor the the, uh, the, the, the newcomer networks. But there have now been several instances, including, of course, the, some of the great sports events that Fox now has control of, in which that, in which that domination has been, has been undercut. So there have been individual moments uh, in the history of, of re in the recent history of broadcasting when the Fox network has actually generated a larger viewership than, than, one of, than ABC, NBC, or CBS. But it still is a relatively unusual uh, event. The, the major, what I'm calling the major networks, the older networks, are very concerned, of course, about this competition, and they are they do various kinds of things to try to, to try to counter, uh, the competition. One of them is by duplicating some of their programming, and, as as we've suggested. But I think Aaron is certainly right that in the last that in the last decade, uh, many viewers, and especially younger viewers, would not uh, be at all conscious of a major distinction. I think if you actually looked at the kinds of programs that are on Fox or on WB, you would recognize that they're that they're, that, that they're, they, they clearly belong that they clearly belong to a certain kind of family of of of, uh, of uh, programming that they have that they share a certain kind of tone that they clearly are appealing to a different kind of demographic, from, and that they're certainly not trying to appeal to uh, the whole of the population in the way in the way that some of the network programs still imagine themselves, uh, some of the major network programs still imagine themselves uh, as capable of doing. Uh, the, one, one implication that a lot of uh, people uh, uh, have, have drawn from these developments is that the networks are, the major networks' idea of themselves as, as, broadcast, as broadcasters to the whole of the population is an anachronism and that it's going to be that it's that, that not only has that system begun to be undermined, but that it will eventually entirely disappear. I'm not sure that that's true, and I think that there have been so, there's been some evidence in recent months, especially since the attack on the Twin Towers, uh, to suggest to us that this that the that the that the consensus function of television may st of the medium may still be very important to the society, although it may be fulfilled by by the, by the television system in ways very different from those that from the ways in which it was fulfilled in, in, in an earlier in an earlier era but your point is a crucial one exactly right well, uh, let me let me uh, uh, 
say a couple of things about I, I, before we're going to talk today about Norman Lear and about Norman Lear's shop. But I, I uh, hope you have the episode of of uh, All in the Family uh, that we saw in the viewing period clearly in 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 mind uh, for our discussion. I even I have that episode with me, and I may actually show you a fragment from it if we have time today. But I have some other Lear materials I want to show you as well. Before I turn to that, though, I want to mention that I've been reflecting on the. Uh, discussion we had last time, and, uh, and especially on the challenge that that Susanna, and then after the class, several other powerful, intelligent women made to me about the about her Susanna's reservations concerning that episode of the Mary Tyler Moore Show, and uh, they're right, and I'm wrong. I think uh, I think the women were right about this, and I think it's characteristic, uh, revealing, you know, that that a man would be less attentive to these nuances than women would be. Uh, there is a problem. There is a problem with the way in which, at the end of that program, in the, at the end of that fragment we were looking at, Mary is so quick to forgive her boyfriend for his promiscuity. There, uh, I, th I think the explanation is partly historical. That is to say, you, and Susanna was acknowledging this when she was raising her own doubts. I think I was not sufficiently attentive or uh, responsive to what she what, what she intended. And, and uh, after class, she renewed her argument, and Robin joined her, and Mickey Dupree joined her, and I felt. Finally persuaded. We see. It takes. Uh, maybe I'm slow, but but I think they were right. I mean, there there is a problem there. The problem is partly a function of historical distance, historical change. What would have seemed in the 1970s like a very daring and remarkable uh, uh, experience seems in the uh, seems at the t at the turn of the new millennium to be rather retrograde. Uh, and uh, uh, I, mean, I think the difference. We're talking about is a nuance, but 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 I think it is uh, intellectually, uh, aesthetically, a problem in that program. Uh, it, it's partly built into the to the problematics of a of a half hour sitcom. I mean, it, yeah, maybe if the program had extended this this uh, moment of this, this Mary's thinking about it and then deciding to take a chance on the on on her promiscuous boyfriend, who's finally said, okay, I'll give up all my other women and 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 I, I really do love you. If if she hadn't made the decision in half a second, it might have seemed uh, uh, a more a more plausible or a more or a more defensible choice. Uh, but I uh, but I think that the primary point is that that in the context of the early 70s, uh, Mary's openness about sexuality to, to begin with, and her struggles to uh, because she comes from a conservative and and uh, uh, middle American background, and her struggles all the way through the show, the series, not just in that one episode. To uh, accommodate herself, to adjust herself to the demands of the new world, is, uh, is, a, is a recurring issue, uh, and it's dramatized in that episode with perhaps at the very end with perhaps a, 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 a too much too much speed and 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 at the expense of uh, psychological plausibility slightly. Uh, in other words, I don't, I don't think that it's a an utterly debilitating defect in that episode, but it is a defect, and it reminds us of how even. Even the most apparently liberated program of one era can seem much more conservative and unliberated in a later era. It's, uh, uh, an, uh, a feminist understanding uh, uh, has now has now been sort of uh, 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 incorporated in our in our general sense of the understandings have been incorporated in our general sense of the world in a way that was not true in the early 70s and, and uh, helps to explain why. Today's audiences would react with greater skepticism and and uh, resistance. To a to a, a moment that the creators of the program surely intended, in a way not not quite the same as as uh, the way in which we would read read the text today. Historical readings are all uh, uh, re reading texts historically uh, is always a, a difficult and complex process, and the episode dramatizes that for us. All right. Let, now, I, what I'd like to do is turn to the other great uh, uh, central. Comedy shop of the early 70s. Uh, in some ways, uh, uh, and <clears throat> at the time, and even more decisive and publicized than them, that was the emergence of the Norman Lear programs. I spoke last time about the way both the MTM and the and the uh, uh, Norman Lear shops them generated themselves a, a whole series of other programs that. Uh, Grew out of the success of their initial of their initial shows, and there are a couple of things to say uh, at the start uh, about the Norman Lear programs. Maybe the first and most important is that 
although videotape had been used before, especially in sports broadcasting and in daytime television, All in the Family, <clears throat> to my knowledge, is the very first prime time fiction programming to use videotape instead of film. And the production of a program in videotape as against film is itself a slightly different process because most of the editing occurs on the fly. There are still three cameras, but the director makes the decision about, he sees three monitors, uh, but, when he, but the director makes the decision on the fly while the program is, while the show is being performed before the live audience about which camera's uh, uh, perspective is going to actually be saved on the videotape. And they sometimes stop to do retakes when they, when they don't get exactly what they want. I was at a, uh, a, a, a taping of one of the Lear shows in the early 70s when uh, after, the pro, after the show was completed, they asked the audience, they have an audience that's always an invited audience that's, that sits up in a kind of bleacher section watching the program. Uh, and they record the audience's laughter. And the audience's presence is, a, is a, uh, uh, something you're powerfully aware of, even though you never see the audience in, a, in, in, in All in the Family and in other Lear programs. Uh, and I, in the taping I witnessed, they, after the show was over, they asked the audience to remain, and they reshot an entire scene. And some members of the audience were grumbling because they had to go elsewhere. And they, and they actually left. They refused to stay. But most, most remained. And so what was supposed to be acted out in sequence in a, in a half an hour turned out to be a, a, a process that took over, an, over 90 minutes. Uh, and the audience wasn't really delighted about that. Of course, the, the actors and actresses rehearsed there the episode long before they actually perform it before the live audience. So one of the things that happens uh, for the, the, in these tape before a live audience uh, uh, systems is that they retain something Of a, of, a, of a connection to, 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 the, to, the, to the roots of drama in theater. Uh, because the, uh, first the cast has, each, each individual program has a different kind of schedule. But it basically, works, uh, like they, they, it basically works like this. They do not film out of sequence, as they might very well do with other kinds of, with other kinds of uh, filmed uh, programs. They, they, have a, they have a rehearsal period in which often the writers come in and listen while the Act, actors do a kind of read-through sitting around the table. This happens every week, and they work on a very elaborate schedule. Uh, because obviously, how could you produce programs quickly enough if you, uh, to fill out a 13, uh, a 13 or a 26-week season if you didn't uh, have a, 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 a very careful system? Uh, uh, they have a read-through around the table. The, that's where the actors begin to learn their lines. And it's also the point at which the writers make changes, when they actually hear the actors speak the line. Sometimes the actors will say, I'm having trouble with this line. The writers will fix it. Right? Then the, and, and, and they have a system for when they change it. When they, when they change the script, the scripts have, some of you may know this, have colored pages. So that it, the script may begin as white. And then you have orange pages for the first revisions and blue pages for the second revision. And in many cases, the final script will have five different colored pa uh, colors of pages in them because there have been that many changes. Uh, and then at a certain point, the cast moves on to the set, uh, and they walk through the role with the director tell giving them sort of basic blocking instructions. Then they often have a rehearsal in which the cameras are there but are not actually working so that they can, they can, they can practice their moves. And then finally, they move to a system in which, the, in which the, they perform before the live audience and the, ca and the, and the cameras are, everything, go everything goes live. Uh, and so, so there is a kind of uh, uh, rehearsal process in which they refine their performances for each individual program. And it, uh, the actors tell, told me that it was always the case that the, walk, that the rehearsal process was often a kind of walkthrough. And they were never really aware of what was alive and dynamic in the, in the particular script until they got before the live audience. And they said it, it was always the case that the live audience energized them in ways that uh, helped to explain the quality of the show. Videotape has a harsher quality, it seems to me, both in, both in, in, in terms of its uh, audit, auditory features and, and visually from what film does. And I think that may uh, help to explain something of the feel, something of the special atmosphere that was characteristic of All in the Family from the very beginning. The show caused controversy almost from the start because it introduced, in a much more explicit way than the Mary Tyler Moore show did, contemporary issues in a contemporary setting. It talked in a way that primetime television had not as openly, ever, had, had not ever done as openly before about the, about the turmoil and difficulties in the, in the outer culture. Uh, it staged a kind of con continual debate 
between the right and the left, between the, between the liberal son-in-law and the reactionary uh, father-in-law uh, that, that uh, was, a kind of, was a kind of symbolic stand-in for the generational uh, debates and the, and, the, and the political disagreements that were organized in the country. And it was commonly the case in that program that contemporary political events, including the Vietnam War, were argued vigorously and discussed on, on Mir's program. Uh, at the time, the show was uh, imagined to be far more radical uh, in, a, in a moral and political and even an aesthetic sense than it seems to us in retrospect, I think, to be. And I've already suggested to you that it's one, one measure of, of, how, of how flexible a consensus system can be is all in the family, which after all does enable this kind of debate, these very sharp divisions, but at the same time remains at the end a kind of reassuring program. Con 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 continues to hold or to embrace uh, ultimately the reassurance principles that are part of any consensus system because things remain all in the family. Because uh, uh, Archie and, and his son-in-law never reach the point of killing one another or, or Archie never reaches the point of kicking his son-in-law out of the, out of the uh, house. Uh, and the very fact that, the, uh, that, that Archie, Archie and Edith's daughter has moved back into their house with uh, uh, her new husband is a, is a, is a, is a, is a mark of the uh, power of family ties uh, in, in the program. So, so, so it's a, it's a, the, the program is simultaneously disturbing but also reassuring in, 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 in a certain sense in, the, in, a, in a way that I've suggested to you is, is a, a fundamental characteristic of, of a consensus system. Great. Um, I actually happened to watch an episode last night of All in the Family. I was up late. And it was an episode where um, there was a new family moving in to the block that they lived on, and um, that there was a. They said that a minority family had put a deposit down on the house, and Archie was all upset because he thought there was going to be another black family moving in, and so Mr. Jefferson comes in and they have a big fight about it. And a lot Jefferson of is the black neighbor of the, of right. the who yeah. later is of course spun off into his own Jefferson. program. Right. Right. And so they have an argument, and like there's a lot of jokes in it, but a lot of them I found were very uncomfortable while they did it. And then it, it turns out that this Puerto Rican family comes in, and they're the family who's put the deposit down. And suddenly, Archie and Mr. Jefferson are together going to sign this <laughs> petition to get the Puerto Ricans out. And um, in the end, the house is sold to, um, to a white couple, but one who is Italian and one who is um, um, Irish Catholic. And Archie ends up offending them, too. And so it was, by the end, you know, everyone was just... I don't know. It was it was uncomfortable, kind of, as I was going through it. But it was just the fact that looking back and knowing that Archie is, you know, supposed to be this person who is, you know, not accepting of these things or not, um, I don't know, less open-minded. And just you know, the fights that they have. On You're the being show generous to him. I mean, he was ridiculous. widely recognized to be a racial a racial bigot. Right. He was a, he was a bigot. He was a preju deeply prejudiced. He so. saw the world through racist perspectives and racist stereotypes. And, and one of the interesting things that occurred early, I mean, the example you're talking about is a characteristic one in the program. And, and there is a kind of boldness about it. I mean, think about it in, a, in another way, is to say, look, this is an entertainment medium. This is supposed to be an entertainment form. And, and many people in the networks were very suspicious of what Norman Lear wanted to do because they said, what, the people won't be amused by these kinds of arguments. They'll be offended. In fact, they were wrong. Lear was right about his sense that the, you know, Lear trusted the audience to be more intelligent than the networks believed them to be. Because Lear said, no, the, the audience is, not only is the audience capable of responding to characters who are flawed and damaged and ridiculous uh, and, and morally questionable, like this race, racist bigot, but the audience is even capable of recognizing that there are certain, that, that a person might be a, might, might be a bigot in one side, but still be a loving father. <laughs> in other words, the program asked for a kind of, resp a kind of response to the, complex, to the complexity of, of Archie's character and of the character of other, other people around him in a way that in simply assumed the audience could understand the characters in the way they understood their bigoted uncle or the way that in which they understood their bigoted neighbor. It was as if, it, it was as if Lear, and I, think, I think it had also had to do with the fact that it was a moment in American culture when there was so much turmoil and debate going on that it was a, 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 a propitious time for Lear to try this. But at the time when he when when the show came on, the net, the networks were not the net the CBS network was very dubious and uneasy. He faced continual arguments with censors, 
And in fact, I mean, I think he often, when he described the program later, after it was recognized as an extraordinary pioneering show, and of course it had a very long run. Can someone, Sean, you have your book with you? Would you check the dates? It starts in 70, run, in, in, in different incarnations, toward the end of its run, it changes its name. It runs at least into the next decade. I forgot to go into, into the um, early 80s anyway, under the title Archie Bunker's Place, or something like that. Uh, but uh, uh, even in its original format, it runs through most of the 70s. Uh, and, and another thing that happens, of course, is that we're all, we also get the pleasures of watching the characters themselves undergo certain kinds of evolutions and changes, uh, both the children. Or, or at one point, finally, in the course of the series, uh, Mike Stivick, the son-in-law, finishes school. Archie's always mocking him for not earning a living because he's trying to get his PhD and become a, a a professor someplace, and he does get a job, but he gets a job in California, and he's moving away. And by this time, of course, what else has happened to the family? They, uh, Gloria and Mike have had a child, and the Bunkers have a grandchild. And uh, one, uh, one of the, one of, in one of the most supposedly daring and pioneering uh, uh, programs of the mid '70s, Lear had a ch uh, the baby had been born, and they actually had a, had a photograph of the baby lying on his back, having his diaper changed. And it was, according to Leah, the first time that a penis was shown on primetime television. He was incredibly proud of this, uh, even though it was a tiny baby penis and it was, uh, and it was hardly visible. Uh, but he thought this was an extraordinary. I, I think Lear himself often underestimated the complexity of his own creation, because he laid so he was he laid so much emphasis on his fights with the, with the. Uh, network censors, uh, uh, and, 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 and in fact was so often so preoccupied by that side of the program. Can I, can we, not can we say dirty words, which didn't happen until the next decade, and, uh, but, but can we, can we, uh, can we say, can we use racial epithets, for example? Can we, can we show certain forms of prejudice? Can we, and, and can we, and can we deal with certain kinds of subjects uh, that are, that were ordinarily excluded from, from uh, a situation comedy especially. There are, there are episodes of All in the Family that deal with, with, with rape and with attempted rape. There's one, one horrific two-part series in which uh, a, uh, an intruder comes into Archie's house and, and, and uh, tries to rape Edith. And it's a very traumatizing and powerful uh, 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 episode, dual ep double episode. Uh, there's a there's a very powerful early episode in which in which uh, Gloria is assaulted and comes home and try, very upset and tries to hide it doesn't want people to know about it uh, uh, the, and of course the show dealt in a very open way uh, often with 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 uh, the political divisions in the country one of the most dramatic and powerful of the All in the Family episodes uh, had uh, d dealt with the extremes of the anti-war protest movement uh, in a way that was particularly memorable. Uh, Mike, of course, is a liberal, but he's not a bomb-throwing radical. But he has friends and acquaintances who are much further to the left than he is. And there's an episode of All in the Family in, w in which one of these very far-left acquaintances of Gloria and Mike's comes to visit Archie. And, w and, and at the very conclusion to the episode, he leaves the uh, house and he walks outside and you hear an explosion. And Archie walks outside onto his por or goes out onto his porch with his wife, and they look, and they're, what's happened to the, the guy? A car bomb has blown him up. And the, and the episode ends on this note of death and terror. One of the interesting things about that, apart from the fact that it, tra it dramatizes the, the turmoil and, the, and, and violence that was um, occurring in the, in the outer society, is that it violates one of the deepest conventions of situation comedy, which is that you have to have a happy ending that wraps things up. And again and again in All in the Family, that convention was violated. The single most powerful such instance of this process that I remember from All in the Family was not one that dealt with political issues, but one which dealt with something much more, in a way, uh, universal and less obviously dramatic. Archie's sense of mortality and death, and their, uh, his fear of death and his fear of aging. And there's one episode of All in the Family which has its usual has has its usual hijinks and 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 comic elements. Archie decides he wants to invest in a in a uh, in a in a get rich quick device, and he has the inventor of the device come to visit him in the house. And much is made of the fact that the guy is a Jew, and Archie's prejudices against Jews come out in 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 richly comic and absurd fashion. Uh, Archie makes his deal with the guy, the guy, and 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 then and then the guy has a heart attack in Archie's living room and, and dies. Uh, and 
at first, Archie thinks the guy's fainted. And it's a very traumatizing experience. And the very final image again has Archie walking outside on the, onto his little porch and Edith standing next to him and Archie holding himself like this and saying, I'm cold, I'm cold. And the episode ends on that note. Again, the, 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 the program took interesting and powerful liberties with our expectations concerning the, not only the content, but even the form of situation comedy. And it's one of the reasons it's such a powerful program. What I'd like to do is show you a couple of episodes, a couple of fragments from some uh, parts of All in the Family, uh, from some scenes in All in the Family, in order to uh, see if we can get some sense of the show's visual style and also of the power it had to do something that I suggested to you was happening in the episode of the Mary Tyler Moore show that we saw, but I think happened much more decisively and regularly on the on All in the Family. One of the things that, what were the dates? Sure. 71 to 83. Uh, uh, so it ran for uh, the, the, over the decade, and, and, and in a way could be said to have defined uh, an aspect of television in this period. Uh, and that's, this is the way in which comedy can suddenly modulate into something much more serious. The way in which a mark of the maturity of television, of the emerging maturity of television in, in, this, in this moment in, a, in the history of the medium is the way in which not just that certain forms become hybrid forms and begin to borrow, on, borrow, borrow from other genres, but the way in which the, the basic sort of what we might think of as atmospheric conventions of, of particular genres begin to, begin to be complicated and even, and, and even undermined. So that you, and, and there were many, many moments in All in the Family, sometimes extended passages in All in the Family, that, that were not at all funny, that were not intended to be funny, that were intended to be disturbing and moving. And, uh, and the, show, the show had an, an extra, once it got its, once it understood what it was doing, it took a little while before, it, before its, its raucous, vulgar tone uh, was brought into a kind of uh, uh, harmony with the character. And my own explanation for that is I, th I think there were, I think one reason for it, although Norman Lear, I once was on a panel where Norman Lear was taking part, and he, w he got angry at this suggestion, understandably, because he said I was denigrating him, or he felt, that he felt I was underestimating his contribution. But I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that as Lear himself became less and less active in the actual creation of the program, he was a writer and producer, of course, and in the early episodes of the program, the first season or so of the program, even when Lear didn't write the show, he looked at every script and he approved every script and he made changes in every script. But then his empire began to expand. And as I said, because of the success of All in the Family, a whole series of other Lear programs began to be developed by the Norman Lear shop. Uh, and that meant Lear had to back off and be concerned with other projects. I think All in the Family got richer when that happened. Not, but not because Lear was a foolish or an unintelligent man, but Partly because he was he, he was very political. He saw the program as having a deep political character, and as he backed off from it, the political dimension of it didn't disappear. But it was but it but it was complicated by a recognition of other, let's call them more personal or psychological energies that were partly embedded in the performances. And I think the real heart of the genius of All in the Family was especially uh, drawn, at least in part, from from uh, the performance by. By, by the extraordinary actor Carol O'Connor, who plays Archie Bunker. I mean, it's the role of a lifetime. It's one of the classic roles in the, uh, uh, in the history of any medium. I mean, it's a very remarkable performance. Uh, and and uh, what, what, uh, what, what uh, Carol O'Connor was able to do was infuse a kind of humanity into a character who on the page might have seemed much more like a caricature. What began to happen, and remember, one of the things about television is the writers and directors, and even sometimes the producers, change but the cast remains the same. So powerful actors over the course of time can exert more and more uh, 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 influence, not even in, uh, over, over the way the show develops, not even necessarily because they actually intervene in the writing process, but because their mere presence, their mere continuing presence, begins to exercise a kind of control on the way the writers imagine how the show could proceed. And, I, and in Carol O'Connor's case, especially after he became a kind of icon after the third or fourth season, he was one of the most famous man, men in America. He was an ambitious man himself, an intelligent man. He actually is a playwright. Uh, he's written plays. And so uh, uh, he, 
he, uh, he began to take a, a somewhat more active role, even in the writing process. But I think the primary thing was that the humanity of the character that he created, at, bodied on the stage, began to seep into the writing in a way that deepened and complicated the program. Uh, so, so the moments I'm going to show you are not the raucous, vulgar, remarkably comic moments in the show. There are other moments, sometimes moments of quiet, uh, in, which the in, in, which the, in which the camera's behavior and the, uh, and the way the camera interacts with the, with the uh, 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 faces of the, uh, of the performers uh, uh, helps, to, uh, helps us to see what we might call the distinctive Lear style. Someone wanted to, yes, Becky. I was wondering, um, sort of like the serial nature of, of television um, with a series, um, after the first season, you say, Lear um, started a lot more projects. So how much do you think that the deepening of the show was sort of dependent on the fact that people were acquainted with the show and acquainted with the characters? I and think that's a part of it, too, of course. The, the, they were sort of allowed to grow, and the writers sort of recognized that. Yes, thing. I think, of course, that's important. Sure, sure. I mean, I think, I, look, I, I don't think there's only one, any one factor. But, but, but I do, in the case of All in the Family, I think, I think one of the things that began to happen was that, that there, there was an impulse toward a, it was, it was more like a political satire. The, the, the satiric elements of the program was, uh, and the political commentary elements of the program were more powerful, I think, in the early seasons than they were later. Not that they were, they never totally disappeared, but they, they became, they then, they became mixed in with uh, uh, a, range, a range of other concerns as well. I mean, they never disappeared from the program. They were always a part of it. It was a politically conscious program. And, it, and, and uh, you know, there were, there were often elaborate debates uh, on the show, of, even about specific presidential candidates and, and particular policies. There was an ongoing argument about whether the United States should be in Vietnam on the program. It was part of the discourse of the anti, of the, of the, uh, it was part of the discourse about uh, uh, the, 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 the project of the Vietnam War in, in American society. It was part of that, and, and I think an important part of that ongoing conversation when it, when it appears. Although, of course, you have to remember that the anti-war movement by 1970 was an immensely potent and powerful uh, force in the, in the country. So again, television is hardly leading. It's really, it's reflecting, and even in a very kind of minor and modest way, reflecting what was by the by 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 the by 1968 and 69 was 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 a gigantic mass movement. I mean, there, you know, the vast majority of people under 25 were against the war by by the late 60s, and there were mass movements, and there were strikes on college campuses, and you know, the country was really in in in, in a tremendous conflicted turmoil over over the over the continuing deaths in Viet, uh, in the in the war, uh, our continuing failure to end the war, and 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 uh, the North Vietnam were not apparently like the Taliban. They didn't. They didn't disappear after a couple of weeks. They were a very tenacious and dangerous, and, and ultimately, if we look at history, a victorious foe. Uh, so by 1970, when uh, when uh, it's actually January of 71 when the show debuts. So I call it 70. It's really 19, the, fir the first month of 1971 when it first appears. By that time, the anti-war movement. Uh, at, a, at an astonishing peak, and there were already now finally there were mainstream politicians who had joined the anti-war movement, and it was, it was, uh, and in that so in that sense, uh, it wasn't in the it wasn't in the forefront of the argument, but it was a part of the discourse, a part a, a part of the argument. Let me let me show you a uh, a moment from 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 uh, an episode of of All in the Family that I that I, that I think captures some distinctive features that maybe are less decisive and, and, and uh, dramatic than the kind of thing we normally associate with this politically explicit and often uh, uh, morally daring, socially daring program, but I think we're at least as important to it. A, a, a sentimental scene, you might suggest, but in, a, in some ways a surprising, I mean, the, the fact is the program was full of such moments of moving intimacy, uh, and uh, it was not simply a continual shouting match at all, especially after it found its, found its, uh, its voice. And think of the subject matter of this episode that I've just shown you. Uh, again, it doesn't, it's not a political subject matter, but it's a traumatic and serious subject matter. Again, not the sort of thing you would normally associate with what we would call an escapist form like situation comedy, Gloria's miscarriage and the way the family, the way the family reacts to it. I hope you were paying attention to the incredibly beautiful and subtle way the camera closed in and backed off and so forth. I want to, I, I, we, I, I want to um, jump to another version of this kind of thing where the, where the camera's behavior is even more uh, decisively revealing of what I think of 
as the as as the Lear style, as the Lear as the Lear visual style. You saw an instance of this in the episode you saw about the lesbian cousin, uh, and especially in the opening scene in the in the motel room. And I, my my memory is uh, Mickey told me that when she showed that this is the Wally, this is the scene we showed on Wednesday nights when you probably weren't there. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I hope all of you will get a chance to look at that episode because it's a very revealing one. But, but I, those of you who attended the viewing will remember that Mickey Dupree reminded people that in one sense that that episode was atypical because it took place outside of the domestic space of the bunker home. But it was still in an intimate domestic space, I mean, or the, the domestic space of the, of the motel room. But I hope you noticed that among other things there was a kind of intimacy in it that bordered on the violation of privacy um, from because, because we saw Edith in her slip, we saw them dressing and so forth. We saw them, we saw them on the bed. Uh, that, that sort of, well, I, I want to show you another scene, much more decisive version of that kind of experience. This one inside the bunker household. The episode I'm, I'm about uh, from from which this fragment is drawn comes relatively late in the series, probably uh, the end of the 70s. It's just the point at which Archie is about to buy the bar that's going to become known as Archie Bunker's Place. And the, uh, there was a two-part episode that dramatizing this event. And uh, part of what it involved was the need that Archie had to use his house as collateral for the bar. And of course, Edith was very concerned about whether or not to, and, and Edith was a, a joint owner on the, uh, on the, on the, in the house, and was required to co-sign uh, any, any, lo any loan agreement. Uh, and uh, it, in the episode, Edith doesn't want to risk the house. Uh, Later on, after the, after the fragment you're going to see, Archie ends up doing something shocking and amazing. He forges Edith's signature to get the money. And it's a tra traumatizing threat to their relationship, which uh, is dramatized with great fullness. But here, uh, part of what, why I want you to see this is I think, I, I think this is Carol O'Connor at his richest as a performer. But it also tells you something about the way in which this bigot this simple-minded, foolish bigot is also understood in his full humanity. I started to say a moment ago, when I forgot to complete the argument, uh, well, that when the show first appeared, not only were there network concerns, there were also concerns, especially from American liberals, who felt that there was something dangerous about dramatizing a bigot on television. And when I was thinking about this, John Kay, I was thinking about the argument that you make about The Simpsons and the representation of Apu for people who might not know much about Hinduism and, and what, you know, what, what about the negative consequences of this. There were American liberals who, who complained bitterly uh, uh, and angrily about how retrograde this program was because it seemed to celebrate a bigot. Here was a bigot who spoke about niggers and, and, uh, and, and kikes and who was uh, oblivious to, to, you know, to, to any notions of tolerance, uh, who was also sort of the star of the program. and had, and had and, and uh, uh, there, there was great concern about this in the early days of the program. And, I mean, I think it was a very condescending argument in a certain sense, because again, it underestimated the audience's capacity to separate out uh, the person's bigotry from his other qualities. In fact, bigots also are fathers. And it's a, it's a, it, the, the, show, the show did not endorse his bigotry at all. He was constantly humiliated and exposed. And some of the greatest comedy in the program came from the fact that Archie was forced into confrontations with people to whom who belonged to uh, ethnic or racial categories to, toward which he was unsympathetic, who were in a positions of authority and power over him. In fact, in the episode of, whose fragment I'm about to show you, that occurs because when he ends up going to the bank to try to get the loan, he has to deal with a black woman, a professional woman who's beautifully coiffed and dressed and, and you know, speaks with a much more educated accent than poor Archie. Who, and, she has, and, and part of Archie's discomfort and, 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 and disturbance in the scene is that he he's, he's, he he needs to he needs to uh, 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 have his loan approved by a by a by, by a black person and uh, that uh, so so uh, and again and again in the program the the, the uh, Archie Art, Archie's retrograde and racist attitudes are not endorsed they're 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 exposed but Archie's uh, but, but the but also the extent to which his racist attitudes are connected to his social class connected to his sense of disempowerment. Are also dramatized, so it's a kind of a, a complex, psychologically nuanced study of what creates certain kinds of racist attitudes. Uh, anyway, this is a sequence, in, a scene in which Archie talks to Edith about his desire to buy the bar. 
I'm going to continue this in a second. Look at this. Look at look at the, look at look at. You can leave the lights down, Clayton. Look look at look at this um, uh, close up and look at the way we've modulated from high comedy into something much more poignant, almost without our realizing it. There's a there's a there's a complexity of tone in this program that predicts the best later television that is as good as the best later television in some ways. Okay. Aaron, I call that Shakespearean, not South Park. <laughs> That's serious. Uh, and and, and the, the melding of tones, I think, is a, 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 a remarkable achievement. One needs to be careful about comparisons. But I was only half kidding when I said that it was Shakespearean. I mean, one of the marks of Shakespeare's genius is his power to do this. At the moment when Cleopatra's about to die and put the asp to her breast, she makes jokes. And the critics. Through the, through the ages, over the centuries, have marveled at Shakespeare's power to dramatize high comedy in moments of high tragedy. Something, something at a, at a, on a much more modest level, but maybe something just as precious, is going on here in the way this program is able to move back and forth between wonderful satiric comedy and deepest kind of human interaction. I, I realize I made a mistake about the program. It's not the mortgage, it's their savings account that is in question in that, in that moment. And I hope you also noticed a couple of other things about this episode that we, I want to rush a bit. We won't have time to discuss it as much as I would like because uh, um, we were under these time constraints. And I, I want to try to finish Lear today if I can, even though it's not a, uh, uh, an, an optimum, optimal uh, situation. And that is the way in which the camera penetrates into the most intimate spaces of the home by the time we get to All in the Family. In most earlier situation comedy, the dramas took place in the, in the public rooms of the house. By the time we get to All in the Family, the camera goes in that. In fact, there are even scenes in the bathroom in All in the Family. A flushing toilet is a recurring comic device, I thought actually overdone and vulgarly silly, uh, in All in the Family. Again and again, sometimes Archie will run up to the, the bathroom is upstairs, and run upstairs, and sometimes the flushing toilet punctuates important events in the, in, in the family's experience, including, comically, uh, the marriage between uh, Mike and Gloria. <laughs> Archie goes upstairs, flushes the toilet as a kind of punctuation, and you hear the flushing toilet while the, while the uh, uh, people are in there, but while, while the wedding ceremony is in, in progress. Uh, so so the, there was a kind of vulgarity to it, but there was also a sense that the camera, the camera and the program were moving into more intimate spaces. Again, obeying a kind of logic that's inherent in the nature of situation comedy itself, which wants in s small and close places, which recognizes that the medium's greatest power is a theater of the face and a theater of human interaction. And All in the Family realizes these tendencies of both the genre of situation comedy and of the nature of American television in a way that was uh, unparalleled for its time. So this drama takes place, and as I say, there, there actually have been, there, there are some scenes in All in the Family which literally take place in the bathroom. You don't actually see, as you do in Sex and the City, people sitting on the toilet and doing their business. But uh, I mean, that, that, we, that had to wait for HBO and the breakdown of the network consensus before that could happen. Uh, uh, although there are on network programs and have been for a long time now, scenes in bathrooms in programs like Ally McBeal, uh, where there's a, uh, a unisex bathroom in this law firm. And a lot of the uh, most ridiculous drama in Ally McBeal takes place in this toilet space. And men have been urinating into, ur into urinals in men's room for ever since uh, uh, at least Hill Street Blues, if not, <laughs> if not, uh, if not earlier. But, but, but All in the Family, in a way, is the pioneer of that, uh, of that dubious uh, uh, interest the camera has in places of elimination, <laughs> because there were actually were drama, scenes dramatized in the, in, the, in the bathroom. But they were comic scenes, often a very confined space in which three or four people would be in the room at the same time. Archie's trying to shave, and Meathead's sitting on the toilet, and Edith comes in for some purpose, things of that kind. But the notion that the, that the family's most intimate spaces is available for dramatization, and in fact, that the that, that our individuality and, and, our, and our deepest nature is most fully revealed, that our individuality and our, and our deepest nature are most fully revealed in these domestic and interior spaces is part of the argument here. And that's one of the reasons why this scene in the bedroom is such a powerful one. And it's, you know, we see, we see Edith, Edith in her night clothes, Archie bouncing her in the bed, talking to her on the, in, in, this, 
in this intimate and essentially private space. But all in the family moved in those, in, 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 into those spaces and dramatized uh, those, those moments of intimacy in which we dangerously declare our connections and our hostilities to the people closest to us in ways that marked a real transition into a serious form of dramatic and literary maturity on American television. Kevin. I want to uh, just, just comment on, on how real and, on, and um, just realistic this, and natural the scene flows, like with, with Archie jumping uh, on the bed waking Edith up. That, 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 that seems like a very natural thing anybody would do to wake somebody up. I, I, I could see a lesser writer would just, you know, like tap her on the shoulder or something. But just, it's just very high comedy. In, in and it's comic like because, of course, he's so oblivious to her. He's so excited. Yeah, and, 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 of course, the most poignant thing, I, I, you're right, of course, Kevin, and the most poignant thing about the scene is the way Archie's own sense of disappointment with his life and his own yearnings to be something other than a man who, a working man who works on the loading dock and is bossed around by other people come out with such poignant. This is a man in his early 50s. And we and and and, what, and of course th th this doesn't come as a surprise to the audience because aspects of this as this part of Archie's character have been available to us from the very beginning and they help to explain they help to explain his superficial racism right? uh, they help to explain his hostility and his aggressiveness which is really a defensive aggressiveness that grows out of his own frustrations his own class position that's serious that's what Balzac does right that's what Dickens does. That's what George Eliot does. American television by now, by this stage, has become a narrative medium that justifies discussion in the same terms as the, as our liter with our literary heritage, uh, uh, with the power to create its power to create character and to give us a sense of the uh, motivations and psychological complexities of character. Comment, Max. Yeah, I was impressed by. Um uh, how the camera was very aware of the intimacy between two people. Um, uh, I think that <clears throat> it effectively zooms in on the face of Archie Bunker. Um, uh, but I was very impressed of how they got the emotions of Archie Bunker, and in the background you saw his wife, um, uh, and how uh, they were so close in the bed together. You know, yes. he's right on top of her, and she's right there, and the camera captured the relationship they had without having to cut between them. It right. was all. Right. In a confined area of the Yes, I think you're right about that. And, I, and, and one, could, one, could, one could do very good work and serious work by looking at the way the camera acts, way, the way the camera behaves on uh, All in the Family, and in other Lear programs as well, but especially triumphantly in, in All in the Family. And again, it, uh, this is a version of what we've said earlier. It was partly a repertory company. Remember, the same, often the same crew would work. Uh, uh, so they, they, it was as if the, people oper the camera operators themselves uh, became sort of, you know, uh, intimately familiar with the with the moves the actors might make, and and uh, it was a kind of, even though even though uh, sometimes uh, usually usually a director would direct for the either a whole season or for an extended period within a season, so even the director uh, would be would stick would stick with the program for for an extended period. So and and it really was in that sense a kind of contained repertory company. I'm going to have to postpone my conclusion of Lear until next time, and we'll just finish our discussion now. I'm going to show you a fragment next time to complete the argument about Lear of the, of the program of Lear's that could be said to sort of predict the post-network era. And that, of course, is, the, is Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, an episode of which was shown to you in the viewing on, on Wednesday night. And we'll look at a fragment, maybe from, I, I think, from the episode that was actually shown on Wednesday night and try to talk about the way in which Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, which appears in 1976 or 77, uh, and, and, is, and is one of a series of Lear programs, but is the first Lear program to go off network, to be sold through syndication, because the networks were afraid to take it, and is sold as a nighttime soap opera, uh, predicts uh, the next, in a certain sense, the kernel of the next 20 years of television is contained in the evolution from All in the Family to Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, which is not a consensus program. And those of you who have seen that episode will know uh, that that's obviously true. Oh, so next time, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, to conclude the argument, and then we'll make a transition to uh, one of the television auteurs that I think are, are, are most interesting from the 80s and 90s, the people, uh, um, Zwick and Herskovich, the people who are responsible for shows like 30-something and 
once and again. And a series, and, and, what, Zwick was the director of the movie Glory, and they're an interesting group. That they're interesting, gifted uh, writer, director, t uh, producer teams that emerged in the 80s and 90s. And we're going to do him. We'll do those people after Lear next time. Sharice, you had your hand up. We're going to. We'll have. Fun. We have two more minutes for discussion. I mean, they're, you mean their physical relationship? Yeah. yeah. Physical they avoided, or whether it was alluded to in, you know, subtle jokes or whatever. I was just curious about that because it seems like a pretty sexually charged scene. The fact that he's jumping on the bed and she's still asleep in her night clothes and so on and so forth. Well, I mean, I think it's an intimacy, and it suggests something of the physical intimacy that married couples long together have with each other. The show was not shy about acknowledging the sexual uh, uh, currents that ran between Archie and Edith. They, they, it was not uh, a dominant subject in the program. And in fact, the, the uh, Archie often made uh, uh, mocking and disturbed comments about the way in which uh, uh, his son-in-law and Gloria were constantly running off to the bedroom to make love. And, it, and it was, sometimes they would kiss each other or hug each other, touch each other in public. And Archie was very offended by this. Uh, he said, you know, he would say things like, "That's disgusting. Can't you keep do that in private, of the, in the privacy of your bedroom where it belongs?" That kind of thing. Uh, so he had this kind of prudish sexual attitude. But there are episodes that dramatize Archie's uh, connection to Edith, and there is the suggest more than a suggestion that, of course, they, their their sexual life is is lively. There are some episodes in which Archie is tempted by other women, uh, and and they they have a kind of comic dimension, but also a disturbing one, especially because you're so by the by the time these episodes appear, you're already so invested in this marriage as a viewer, that he, that, that that Archie's uh, uh, impulse to stray is is uh, uh, shocking to you in some ways. Uh, uh, so so it, I, I, I I hope this doesn't seem evasive, Sharice. I can't name specific episodes. We don't actually ever see them uh, lying on top of each other in post coital pleasure, but there is clearly the sense. That they that they are uh, uh, physically intimate with each other, uh, and that and that it ma and that that intimacy matters to both of them, and there's certainly the this the sense we get uh, from various episodes that uh, er at earlier stages in their in their lives they were they were <laughs> very active, and there's some there's some sense you know that they're that things have calmed down for them in what they regard as middle age. Yes. How about James L. Brooks? Will we have any uh, opportunity? James L. Brooks. Brooks. Well, he, he's one of the Mary Tyler Moore folks. And, and, but, but he's, and he's since, he's since like in the 90s, he's, yeah. he has a very prolific He becomes career. a very important director like in movies, doesn't he? Yeah, well, well, well he, he's also the... In terms the, of endearment, terms is of, one of his films. Yeah, but, but also The Simpsons in television. The Simpsons, Simpsons and uh, Mad About You, is that you know Brooks? I don't know whether Brooks is involved with it. I don't think so. But, but Brooks is an important figure. But, but I think, I think it, on balance, probably, although very, you know, he's connected to a lot of very important programs. and, and uh, a, uh, I think it's a lot of his most interesting work in the movies re, uh, has an authority because he, he did his apprenticeship in, in television, learned, learned his skills on television, and I think his movies have a kind of intimacy and psychological seriousness that most other movies of the era do not have. The reason is that he comes out of television and he, he values character in the way that television allowed him to value character. But we don't. We won't have time for Brooks beyond a few comments. Uh, and there are other folks like Stephen Bochco that we're not uh, are going to going to deal with beyond what we've already done with Hill Street Blues. Uh, they, uh, but but I'll mention a few of these auteur types that begin to emerge uh, in the in the in the in the era when the network system begins to break down. We're finished for today, folks. I will see you next week.